Coming up next, we're going to have John Gallant. Now, John has a really interesting presentation. He's going to be talking to us about secret list development from local to cloud with new the new Azure SDKs, Project Ty, and Kubernetes. So it sounds like there's a lot of cool stuff in here, John. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. All right, great. Thank you. All right, so I'm John Gallant. I'm on the Azure SDK team, and I do a bunch of work with Azure Developer Experience. Uh, with things like uh, Project Ty and deploying to Kubernetes, I work with Storage Explorer, Azure, a bunch of these tools that surround the developer experience. Um, and uh, a lot of the things I do, I build apps and I, um, I learn a lot and give that feedback to the product teams um, as well as you know work with partner teams like Project Ty. Uh, so today what we're gonna cover, let's go to the next slide here. Three big things. The new Azure SDK, we heard Jeff talk a little bit about that, uh, the, the new uh, preview project tie, uh, and how that, how that all relates to Azure Kubernetes. So a quick mention about the new Azure SDK effort, please go back and view uh, Jeff's uh, talk earlier. Uh, but the, the gist of it is that it's all about developer productivity. So what we want to do is help improve developer productivity for uh, our team, as well as uh, anybody using Azure. Um, so when, when we uh, joined or, or formed the team um, a couple of years ago, we looked at the landscape of the Azure SDKs, um, and we discovered that they're spread out amongst many repositories. Um, so we have, I, I think, dozens, maybe a hundred repositories out there um, with all the various languages and services. It was really hard to keep track and didn't have a, a consistent experience, which means developer productivity drop. Uh, so what we wanted to do is say, how can we improve things? And we said, let's have consistent language support, consistent OS support, um, a consistent CI uh, C pipeline, as well as consistent package delivery to all of the, the mainstream package, um, uh, package managers. So you can see the top is kind of chaos, what we um, uh, adopted. And the new is the bottom is what we're, our, our aim is to go to something much more consistent, much more predictable. Um, and so we have all of these design guidelines that we'll talk a little bit about later, but they're all open source and we'll, we'll reference those. Um, so to get to uh, the main SDK website, go AKA MS AZ SDK, um, we'll, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Um, and then a three minute video that I created, AKA MS AZ SDK slash intro, will bring you through that uh, in much more detail, as much detail as we can get in three minutes. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is how we can use Azure SDK and Ty together to build secretless uh, applications. And by secretless, I mean, uh, the only secrets that are stored are in Key Vault. So local development, as well as uh, cloud development, you are not storing or having to manage your own service principles. And we can do that through the new Azure Identity Library, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so, so locally, we are using Azure CLI, the credentials that you already have. Um, and in the cloud, we're using managed identity and any other secrets, like I said, are stored in Key Vault. So how that looks is like this. Um, so the new Azure Identity Libraries provide us with this object or this class called the uh, token credential. And we have a slew of classes that are derived or, uh, that um, from token credential and token credential basically gets tokens. Uh, and so from, from a developer experience perspective, you have the Azure CLI credential, you have VS Code credential, you have Visual Studio credential and a slew of other developer credentials. So in for Java, we have IntelliJ credential, for example. Um, so for .NET, we have those three plus environment variables, plus um, interactive browser control, a ton of these um, credential types available that you can use in your application. Um, and so what that, what that means is that when you're already logged into one of these tools, you'll be able to use that identity to authenticate with Azure. So for example, if you're Azure CLI, uh, you do AZ login, you assign roles to your uh, principal, to, to your account, and then you access say blob storage. Um, and in production, you use managed identity. Uh, so this is a quick code example on um, what Azure identity looks like. We have var cred equals new default Azure credential. So default Azure credential is an opinionated chain token credential. Uh, so what that means is it first looks for environment uh, uh, credential. So it'll look for Azure underscore client underscore ID underscore client underscore secret and tenant ID um, that you have stored in environment variables. It'll look for uh, managed identity. 
uh, and then a slew of um, uh, developer credentials, Azure CLI and so on. So it's an opinionated way of, of building um, you know, a, a chain token credential, which you can see on, this, on the, the next line here is an example of a custom chain token credential. Uh, so if you, if you don't want to use Azure credential, you want a very, your, your own uh, chain, you can build it however you like. So you have managed identity credential here and then Azure CLI. So what this does is it will first try uh, managed identity credential, a fast fail. If that fails, it will try Azure CLI credential. If it can't find it either, it will just fail. Um, and then as you can see, getting back to the consistency and productivity part of things, you can see that the, the last line there is new secret client. So all of our clients, um, all of them that support OAuth um, and, and uh, token-based authentication, except a token credential is one of the parameters into the constructor. So you see URI here, that's the URI to your, um, your key vault. Uh, and the credential is one of these objects that you've constructed. The clients are smart enough to know when it needs a token. So you don't have to get a token at a time. You just pass that in. It will call get token on that token credential object and be on its way. So let's take a quick look at a quick breeze through. Uh, this is the app we're going to look at a little later. Um, take a quick look here. So we have uh, the Azure SDK website. So this is AZ SDK, um, AKS MS AZ SDK. Uh, so all of the releases here, um, you can see that we have a lot of packages. So when, when we started, we built this website um, uh, back in November of last year, I think we had seven. Yeah, it's continuing to grow. These are the, the libraries that follow the new design guidelines. As you can see, we have many that are in GA and we ship betas uh, continuously, we ship monthly. Um, so you can come here, you can find all of the new client libraries, all the new resource management libraries, which are in preview for .NET. Um, and then this all tab, is, I've been working hard on this, but this is all of the libraries that have ever been published for Azure. There's a lot of them out there. Um, what we're trying to do is, as part of our inventory is collect them all. And we decided to just open source all of them so you can find, uh, so this is like the de facto list of, of repository of, of uh, packages. And we have the same across all the languages. Um, so let's just take a look at the website. So uh, um, up at the top, we have blog. So let's just make sure that you are subscribed to our blog and we have weekly posts, sometimes twice a week. Uh, and we also have guest posters. Um, and so we are, you know, if you have a good experience with the Azure SDK or want to you know, share your experience, please do uh, contact me and I can set you up to be a guest blo uh, blogger. Daniel Krzykowski did a good post. Uh, Mike McCall did one. Um, we have a lot of uh, good posts out there that you can go and follow up and read on. Um, so also from this website, we have all the guidelines, open source, published, right there that you can review. You really shouldn't uh, have to, but it's, sometimes it's good to go and reference and see, you know, what, what were the design decisions behind the libraries and so on. Um, and also we have um, the releases page, which is this, and we have the API reference, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have this GitHub link here, which takes you to the central repositories. It links to everything that we create are here. Um, so we call this kind of the landing uh, repository. Uh, it's a good one to go to. Um, and then obviously we're on Twitter. So Azure SDK, please go follow us uh, right now. And um, we, we post quite regularly about new SDK stuff coming up. So definitely good to subscribe there. So let's take a look at a scenario. Say you're looking for the table client. You come here, you click on client libraries because you know you want the new latest one and you find table. Okay, so then you see the tables uh, is in beta right now, beta two. Uh, we have Microsoft Docs, we have GitHub Docs, and we have the source code all linked there. So if you wanted to install it, you click the NuGet link, you add a package however you'd like through the .NET CLI, package manager, or what have you. And then you go here, this is the, these are the official Microsoft documents for uh, the client library. And it contains the latest version, a preview version, uh, and the old version. Uh, so what we did is we, um, currently this platform doesn't support every version uh, ever published. So what we did is we, we created a website like this that publishes every version of, of the library documentation. So if you happen to be on a version that is not uh, mainstream, we, we hope to provide the documentation for you. But eventually those will be merged, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then we also provide a link directly to the source code from that releases page. So if you have to debug something, you want to re research something, uh, or whatever you uh, need to do with that. Okay, 
so let's switch back over to slides. So that was just a quick introduction there to the Azure SDK. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this app I've been building. So I, I wanted to build an app that uses as many of these Azure SDK libraries as possible and something that we can continually grow on. So if we have a new uh, library come out, we could uh, integrate it into uh, the apps. Uh, and one of the libraries that we support uh, includes extracting text and analyzing sentiment. And I thought, what uh, better way than to extract text from memes and decide if they're positive, negative, or neutral memes? So I created Memealyzer. Uh, and this, this is all open source, John GIO, Memealyzer on GitHub. Uh, so let's talk about it. So you click the plus sign under the logo. This is not currently public because it's uh, it's easily hacked. Uh, you know, uh, and I didn't want the risk of having images out there that were not safe for kids. Um, so when you click plus, um, it will add a random meme from Reddit to the list here. Uh, it will extract the text, determine the sentiment of that text, and then change the border color. So green is going to be positive, yellow is going to be neutral, and red is going to be negative. Um, so you can, you uh, my, my kid actually uses this. He'll come here, he'll click plus and just read memes for a bit. He finds it entertaining. Uh, so there's some value here. Uh, so the, the, the goodness behind the funness uh, is this architecture here. And so what we have here are uh, a Blazor WebAssembly web app. Um, so I tried to use all the latest and greatest stuff in building this. So Blazor WebAssembly has been a treat to work with. Uh, ASP.NET API, a .NET uh, service, which is actually just a console app that runs in a container, uh, as well as an Azure function. Uh, and so how that works is you post an image. See, uh, number one there, you post an image to the uh, API. The API adds it to blob storage, adds it to a queue. The .NET service receives those messages, extracts the text, Number six gets the sentiment, saves the document. And right now that we have a data provider model so we can try the, the new Cosmos library or the new tables library. Um, and so there's a switch there that you can turn off and on through configuration. Um, and then once that's saved, it goes back to another queue, back to the Azure function, signal our service, and then back to the, the Blazor front end. There's obviously many ways you can build this app. You can do functions, you can do you know, whatever you whatever you want. Um, but I wanted to build something that uses as many of the libraries as possible. Uh, as speaking of libraries, that, so I, I mentioned the Azure uh, table library that we uh, are in beta. Um, let's take a look at this next slide. I think you're going to find this interesting. So I've been working a lot with the storage team to get us to a point where we can ship Azureite with table support. It's been a huge ask to the community. Uh, for these, those of you who don't know, Azureite is a cross-plat Azure a storage emulator. It's had blobs and it's had queues for a while. And if you wanted to use table, you had to use like an old version. And so a, a kind of very bad experience. Uh, so we we worked hard to get a preview one ready for today. Um, and so now this app, the app, is all running on preview one. Azure Rite is running, so I'm saving the table storage. Um, I pushed out a sample at uh, John GIO Azure Rite table dash type. Um, go take a look at that. Um, please use it. Let us know uh, if it works or not. We're also working hard to get that to work in durable functions. So coming soon on that. So let's go and take a look at how we're doing secretless in the Memealizer code base. So this is an identity class here. This has a chain token credential, and I'm calling get chain uh, get credential chain, uh, and this is shared amongst all my clients, so you can reuse this. Uh, and I am saying I want to use managed identity and Azure CLI -like credential, just like we saw in uh, the slide earlier. Okay. Then when I um, new up my clients, I have my data provider, and I initialize it based on some config value. I initialize uh, my data provider, and I pass it that same credential that I initialized up here. I then initialize my other uh, clients. So I have app config, I have blob, I have queue, I have another queue, I have form recognizer and text analytics, all using that same uh, Azure CLI credential for local or managed identity when I ship to production. Okay. Uh, and then in the uh, queue service, you just new up that client, initialize async, and then you can access your clients that way. Um, so this, this right. So all I had to do locally is just AZ login, and this just works. Inside of my Cosmos data provider, how I have no secrets is I when I want to get my Cosmos key. So Cosmos doesn't 
officially support you know, Azure Active Directory or uh, um, OAuth. So what we need to do is store the secret somewhere. We don't want to store it in, configura uh, in um, application code at all. So we want to put it in Key Vault. So I'm using that same credential. My credential has the appropriate uh, permissions to access Key Vault. I'm getting that secret name. And then when I new up my Cosmos client here, I'm passing it that key. I also took it a step further. So I've been playing with functions a bit. Uh, and I realized that functions um, you know, can use some work when it comes to the secretless development um, paradigm. Uh, they uh, you know, expect you to store your settings in local settings or environment variables. But for, for locally, what I wanted to do is you know, store locally and production, store my secrets, connection strings in Key Vault. And so what I'm doing here is um, inside of the uh, function startup configure method, I am calling Key Vault using the Key Vault clients. I am getting the secrets and then I am setting an in-memory collection here and then adding those to environment variables. And then it, the uh, client sync function just automatically works. So let's take a look at that. Here. So you can inject regular environment variables into the uh, bindings like so. And you can also pull this from an environment variable here, which I set in my startup. So a super good way to, to um, integrate Key Vault into uh, Azure Functions. Okay. Um, and then a just quick look. This is my .env file. It's super simple and it works across all of my applications. So whenever I load an app, I always just load my .env file. Um, so all, also, this is all Terraform. So all the Terraform scripts are up there that you can you know, steal, uh, use in your own apps. Uh, but I, I just have a couple of variables here. So there's no secrets stored uh, in my code at all. OK, so let's jump back to the slides. So the next big thing that we're going to talk about is Project Ty. Uh, so as I was bringing my app to Kubernetes, I discovered that, wow, it is uh, very difficult uh, to do inner loop Kubernetes development in the current state. Um, there's so many tools and so many YAMLs. Uh, and just the cognitive overload is crazy. Um, and so what I um, <laughs> did was I, I did a phone a friend a lot. So uh, Vita has been helping me out. Noel has been helping me out um, to try and figure this out. But there's so many things that you have to do when you, you want to take an application from you know, local to containers to Docker Compose, to Azure Kubernetes services, just there's just so much. Um, and so as I was doing this, uh, Fowler said, hey, check out Project Ty. I did, and uh, I'll tell you what, I love it. Um, it's absolutely save it, a lifesaver, uh, and I'm going to show you how. So basically, on the left, you have all these tools. On the right, you have Project Ty. I'm going to get into this in detail. So we have all of these things that you need to do for inner loop development, right? Uh, when you when your end game is Kubernetes, when you know that you're going to have to ship to Kubernetes, meaning that you're going to have to containerize your app, you're going to have to think about all the Kubernetes things. Uh, you have to go through a certain flow, and a lot, honestly, a lot of people uh, want copy and paste from existing applications that they've already built. Uh, don't know that Compose exists, don't know that Scaffold exists, and just don't know that these tools exist. So they struggle really hard. Um, to get anything going uh, and often uh, just leaving frustration, um, which was, I, I was there many times. Um, so let's talk about each of the things that you need to do and how Ty can replace them. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back and forth between code so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, first thing, containerize projects. So in, in, with other tools, you have to create Docker files. You have to um, you know, know what you know, base image you need to go for. You need to know that you need to, you know, uh, publish your .NET application and bind to this DLL and all of that work. And then you have uh, Blazor, which uses Nginx. You have you know, all, uh, which can use Nginx. Uh, and, and all of that is, you know, for somebody who's who hasn't done containers and just, you know, let's say you're a .NET developer and never done containers, um, there's, that addition, that's that, there's that step that you have to go through to learn about Docker and learn about Docker files. Eventually you should, but uh, should you have to in order to get something running? Um, well, with Project Ty, you, create an app um, and then you call tie run and it will automatically detect that you have an application in your directory and it will run it um, just without you having to create a docker file okay so let's just switch over to that here so this is a, a typical doctor docker file that i had to create for each of my each part of my application 
right? And so I have MCR, you know, Microsoft, .NET, SDK 5.0. I upgraded all of these to 5.0 recently. Uh, and then, um, you know, you got to do a bunch of things. You got to know to do all of this stuff. Uh, with Ty, I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to create a Docker file. Now, uh, you can. You can create your own Docker file totally fine, but you don't have to, and that's the point. Okay, so here, the, the next step. Okay, so you've containerized your, your apps. Now you need to run them. Uh, you need to start them. You need to tear them down all together. How do you do that? Uh, it's typical to go with the Docker Compose approach, um, which it, basically it's just that. You do DC up, or, or Docker Compose up, Docker Compose down, and it will start and stop your services. Okay, so up until this point, um, yes, it's one-to-one. -one. Tie YAML to Docker Compose. And as an aside, uh, the team is looking at Docker Compose as potentially have parity with Docker Compose. Um, so to make it easier to go from Docker Compose to Tie. Um, but as of right now, there's a, there's a few differences. Um, so what we do is we say Tie Run, Tie YAML. Um, and that will give us the um, you know, the specifications of the applications that we want to start and stop, and they have tagging and so on. So let's just let's just take a look. So inside of my run, so this is this is a simple uh, you know, tie run here, right? So simple tie run is going to by default use the tie YAML file that's in the directory. There's a bunch of flags. We'll talk about some of those in a bit, but that that's tie run. So I just created this script called run, which wraps uh, tie because tie currently doesn't do environment variable replacement, which I need. So I have a couple of scripts to do that do that work for me. Um, so let's just take a look here. So we have tie. And this is what a Thai uh, YAML file looks like. And you can see here, I'm using that alpha of Azure, which includes table storage right there. Um, you can tag, so you can filter. So I only want Azure for dev. Um, you can say, I want a web app. Here are the ports. Here's what I want to bind in my container. Here's the API container ports. Um, and it also supports ingress. So you can say, map this URL, this path to this service, even locally. This even works locally. And, uh, so it's super, super nice. Um, and it, this having ingress here saved me from having to do a bunch of config, especially with Blazor. A Blazor WebAssembly doesn't have service discovery uh, built into it yet, uh, because it runs in the browser. Um, and so Ty does service discovery. I'm not going to get into it, but um, where you can, uh, Ty will automatically discover your services for you. But having ingress allowed me to just uh, minimize my uh, configuration for that. Okay, so that's Ty YAML. Now let's take a look at the next one. So debug. You know, debug symbols in a container. I, I have talked to some of the, uh, the people um, that I trust in this space, and they they're they just like, I don't have a way to do this consistently that I really like. Um, and so it's not something that people do typically and do it with ease. And when you want to do it, it's pretty complicated. Um, and so it, the ties way to solve that is, just, is to add a dash dash debug. Um, and after debug, you can put a service name. You can say dash dash debug you know, uh, Q service, for example, and that will wait. It'll spit out the process ID and it will wait for you to attach a debugger to that process. So let's take a look at that. So here in my debug right there, I'm doing tie run, still tie run, right? But I have this debug down here, see that? And I'm saying wait for this service. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so what then what you do is you open up the project for that service, you attach, it'll stop at breakpoints, it works beautifully. Another option to debug is the Thai Explorer VS Code plugin extension, sorry. Uh, so it, you, you, you can come here, you can click on this little bug icon here to attach to a running process. Super slick, I tried it a couple of times since I installed the uh, extension, works great. Next thing, scaffold uh, or, or watching files. Typically, you use scaffold, uh, which is another YAML. Uh, with Thai, uh, so what this will do is it will watch files, rebuild, rebuild your containers, deploy to Kubernetes. Uh, with Thai, you do Thai run dash dash watch, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory uh, for Kubernetes files. So we want to go from Docker Compose to Kubernetes files, which you need to deploy. So you have to do. Um, you have to use something to convert them, or you have to copy and paste, as my friends say. Uh, and so, um, co uh, so com compose with a K. You, you 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 feed it your Docker Compose YAML, and it and it outputs 
Kubernetes manifest files. So with Ty, you don't have to worry about those manifest files at all. But if you want to, you can use the Ty generate method, which will spit out the files. So let's just take a quick look at that. Take a look here. So this, this is after running Ty generate. Yeah. So here you go. So deployment, all of this stuff, all the services, all of those things are all defined right there um, in that, including ingress. So like I said, you don't have to think about it, but it's available if you need it. Great. Uh, the next thing is deploy. So when you want to deploy to Kubernetes, you can use kubectl, you can build a Helm chart, or instead of those things, you can use tie deploy. Um, and that's going to talk to a, a container registry. It's going to it's going to build. It's going to build your containers. It's going to push that registry, and it's going to push your uh, Kubernetes manifest files to the um, Kubernetes context that you've specified, right? So super super handy. So I, so let's. I mean, taking a look, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, potentially seven tools that Ty replaces, um, and I personally can't see for you know I can't see myself going back to the old way. And I wish I would have had Ty, you know, months ago when I started. Um, so I, ho I hope you check it out. I hope you start there uh, and don't have to go through the pain that I uh, went through. Um, so let's take a look here. OK, so let's wrap it up. So I want you to get in touch with me, anybody else on the Azure SDK team. You can contact us. You can follow through Twitter. Um, give us feedback on GitHub. We are on GitHub. Uh, you know, we have all, we have all our repositories, our issues. Everything is filed there. So please do go visit us on GitHub. Uh, all of our releases, start using them, contributing to them. Um, subscribe to our blog. So two, two big things to check out, new Azure SDKs and Ty. So thank you very much. Let's take some questions. Hi, John. So it looks like our you, you just got some questions for you. So let's uh, let's get to it. Uh, first one's from Dan. Dan is asking a question for John. Desktop apps can't have managed identities. How can a store app access Key Vault without storing credentials, strings in source code or config files? Yeah. So in that case, you would want to use something like the interactive browser control. Um, and what that allows you to do is to uh, the end user. Uh, would get a pop-up and say authenticate, and then at that at that point, if you have MFA enabled, um, you know you, they would follow that authentication path. So that that's a good way. You know, I, I know a lot of people in the identity space, but please do reach out to me on Twitter if that doesn't answer, and we can uh, you know get that result for you. Sure, sure. All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, Alex is asking, do you have any advice towards Git repo structure? For making it easier to use tools like Ty, it makes sense to combine several microservices into one repo. On the other hand, dividing in several repos makes releasing slash deploying individual services easier. Yeah, so one of the things with Ty is that you can specify uh, as a service, um, you can specify other YAML files. So you can do that construction like you're talking about. Um, uh, for for my sample app, Memalizer, I decided to put all in one uh, Thai YAML file. And somebody else asked a question today, too, on Twitter, which was, um, um, you know, how, how do I manage, you know, de building and deploying only certain, you know, services? So there's a lot of these complex scenarios that you know, I would love to dig deeper into, um, you know, so all the capabilities might not be there right now, but let's, let's hear your scenario and let's flush it out. All right, sure. And let's, uh, I think we have time for just one more question. And this one is coming from Metro Developer. Um, this person is asking, can I use Cosmos DB instead of Azure Table? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you can use Azure. Uh, you can use Cosmos DB instead of Table for sure. And take a look at the Memalizer um, uh, repository. I actually have a data provider in there where you can switch between the two, but it's full code for both Cosmos and Table. Um, the Table, um, uh, Azure Rite supports table emulator, but Co uh, Cosmos has its own emulator, if that's what you meant. Yeah. All right, great. Well, John, thank you so much, man. That was a yeah. great presentation. I know for thank me, you. I've been playing around a lot with Ty, so yeah, I didn't great. know until today that there was a VS Code extension. So I'm going to make sure I spend some time today and go ahead and check that out. You got to know some people. No, it's it's coming. I, I, apparently, I don't know the right people, man. I need to, I need to work that out. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, man. All right, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it.